this evening, and I want to welcome you to an evening to celebrate scholarship and ministry and theology with uh, my good friend Thomas J. Ward. Especially want to welcome uh, those who are tuning in via Facebook Live tonight, and uh, it's great to have all of you here in NNU's Leah Peterson Learning Center. Uh, tonight is the official kickoff celebration uh, of the launch of Tom's newest book. It's a book with an attention-grabbing title, God Can't. And uh, tonight we're going to be able to hear from the author about uh, the journey that led to this book and some of the conclusions that he's come to in it. This book is already a number one bestseller on Amazon. If you uh, aren't following Tom on Facebook, you should, and you know all these things already if you did. Uh, and uh, amazingly, it is a number one bestseller in nine different categories right now on Amazon in its first week. Uh, categories including, I love this one, good and evil philosophy. <laughs> I guess our students have got the word out about philosophy. Christian counseling, Christian ministry to the sick and bereaved, psychology and Christianity, adult Christian ministry, science and religion, Christian church leadership, spirituality and health, and religious counseling, all number one uh, this last week, and uh, that's quite a feat, uh, especially at a place like Amazon. Uh, God Can't is available in trade paperback, and uh, there'll be copies uh, available for purchase this evening if uh, you'd like to pick up a copy. Uh, it will also be available in hardcover uh, and also um, it's available in ebook format too. And I'm told by the end of the week it will be available in audiobook format in English and Spanish, which is uh, amazing. Um, Tom, as you probably know, is a prolific writer, a speaker, and a gifted photographer. With more than 25 books to his credit, he strives to think deeply as a Christian and as a theologian. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome. Oh, the depth of the riches and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. In my mind, Tom really seems driven to search deeply through scripture and in theology, to give scrutiny to many issues that often Christians are afraid to think deeply about. And so tonight, um, I think the subtitle of Tom's book uh, really drives home his mission for this evening and uh, for the impact this book offers the church and, and our family and neighbors. How to believe in God and believe in love after tragedy, abuse, and other evils. We're really thrilled to have you here this evening, and I know Tom uh, is excited to talk about how this book came to be and uh, what it is, has meant to him and to so many others already. And so uh, let's uh, welcome Tom up. Please help me welcome Thomas J. Ward. Thank you, Jane. I was really worried about doing a book launch because I thought maybe five people would show up. <laughs> Thanks so much for showing up and there being many, many, many more people than five. I really appreciate you coming out and I appreciate those of you who are following on Facebook Live. Uh, this title, God Can't, is not a gimmick. I did get a lot of people uh, sending notes and saying, well, that title ought to sell a few books. And I said, well, maybe. It also might uh, offend some people. It might give some people the wrong impression. But um, to people who have been hurt deeply, people who have been victims of abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, people who have been victims of injustice, have been hurt deeply, they oftentimes hear the idea that God can do just anything. And that's meant to give them hope. But they ask themselves this question, if God can do anything, then why didn't God stop what happened to me? Why didn't God prevent the genuine evil that I've suffered? Where was God when my life sucked? 
Now, of course, the Bible in some parts talks about God being able to do anything. Matthew says nothing is impossible with God. And so Christians often cite that and say God can do anything. But they ignore many other biblical passages that talk about things that are impossible for God to do. The writer of Hebrews says God can't lie. The writer of James says God can't be tempted. And my favorite passage is a passage in which uh, Paul is writing to Timothy. And he says, when you are faithless, God remains faithful because God cannot deny himself. God can't deny himself. I think that means God can't deny God's own love for us. So, my primary motive in writing this book with this controversial title is to help people. I want to help people who ask deep and difficult questions who are simply not satisfied with, you know, God needed another angel in heaven, or, you know, this is really just supposed to make you better. Your rape is going to build your character. Or, you know, God has a plan for you. Those kinds of answers leave many people feeling hollow. In fact, the number one reason, according to most polls, why atheists say they can't believe in God is this issue, the problem of evil. If there is a loving and powerful God, then why didn't God prevent my genuine suffering? Now, I've been thinking about the ideas in this book probably since I was 12 or 13 years old and uh, trying out some possibilities, rejecting them, trying out others. But about uh, three years ago, in 2015, I wrote a book called The Uncontrolling Love of God. It was published by an academic press. I tried to write in fairly easy to understand language, but my mother had a hard time understanding it. And Kimberly right now is shaking her head, no, it's not that easy to understand. <laughs> and my wife kept saying to me, uh, Tom, you've written 20 some books. Uh, five people read your books. Why don't you write a book that everyone can read? <laughs> Actually, she didn't quite say it that way. But she said, uh, this was her, her little label. Tom, why don't you write a Barnes and Noble book? By which she means, a book you could go to the store, pick up, read, and actually understand. So this is a response to that. This is the Barnes and Noble book. In other words, you don't have to have a theology degree to understand what's going on in this particular book. It's written using lots of real life stories, several dozen actual stories that people either sent to me or I found. One of the gratifying things about uh, the Uncontrolling Love of God book is that I got letters from people, I got Facebook notes, etc., where people said, I read your book, and for the first time in my life, I don't think that God just stood by and allowed the horrible things that happened to me. Thank you so much for writing this book. And so in writing this new book, I said, I want to incorporate some of those stories, a lot of those stories. I also draw from figures that many people have heard of, stories that, and I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, of people, stories who many people know. For instance, um, when I was a young kid, there was a writer named Johnny Erickson Todd. How many people have ever heard that name? Okay, yeah. Pretty famous person. She's a person who dove into the shallow waters of Chesapeake Bay and broke her neck and responded to that horrible situation by uh, writing books, recording albums, going on speaking tours. I actually saw her when I was a kid one time at a, at a Nazarene convention. Uh, she ended up starting a, a foundation for people with disability. She ended up being an amazing person doing amazing things. But in the process, she came to believe that God wanted her to be paralyzed. In fact, and I quote this in the book, she thinks God was punishing her by breaking her neck for her sin. I think that view is the wrong view. I appreciate Johnny Erickson and all she's done, but I don't think we have to have the same view of God as Johnny Erickson to appreciate the excellent things that's come out of her life. So I also talk about uh, the ideas from people like Rob Bell or Ellie Wiesel, Paul Young and his famous book, The Shack, Bart Ehrman, probably one of the most famous agnostics or theologians uh, today who's a Bible scholar, Shelley Rambo, and, and many more. Um, 
This book also addresses some key biblical passages that people have wrestled with. The story of Job, for instance. Or the idea that all things work together for good to those who love God who are called according to his purpose, etc. This is not really like a heavy-duty Bible book. If you're a Bible nerd, you'll probably be dissatisfied by how much I use the Bible. But I do think it's important to address some of those key biblical texts and ideas. And I do so in this book. What I want to do tonight is uh, show a little video that kind of summarizes the five main ideas of the book. Uh, but first, I want to thank some people, a bunch of people actually, a bunch of you who are sitting right here in front of you, and a bunch of you who are following on Facebook Live. There are people here sitting in this crowd who read early drafts of this book, and I want to thank them. There are people in this crowd who gave their own stories that I have in this book. I quote lots of people, uh, not lots of people, some people in this audience today. Um, some people gave me some ideas that I stole and put them in this book. There's also people in this crowd who have already posted reviews on Amazon and other sites, and I want to thank you for doing that. And if I try to point out all the people in this room who have engaged me in conversation about these issues that are in this book, we would be here all night. Because there are many, many, many of you who not only taught me when I was young, I look at Ralph Neal over to my right, he was my professor a long time ago. He's a young guy, but I'm old. Uh, but also many of you who've been conversation partners with me over the years here. Um, there are people that in and you who helped in great ways. Arnie Etriai, for instance, and his crew in communications allowed me to record a separate book video trailer that I'm not going to show tonight and also uh, do the audio recording and the communications. Uh, of course, uh, Amy and allowing us to do this here in the library tonight. Um, there's also people who've sent all kinds of notes saying they've already got Sunday school or small group discussion set up because what I've done in this book is I've add, added questions at the end of every chapter. So I want to thank you for already thinking about how to use this book. In the last, I believe, three days, I received emails from theologians at Boston University, Princeton, and Drew Seminary, all of which are going to use this book in their spring uh, theology classes. So it's not only aimed at folks in the church, but people in scholarship and seminaries are using it, in part because, one, as one person said in, my, in an email, you actually write in ways that my students can understand. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that as a major compliment. <laughs> Um, this is also the first chance, at least for some of you, that I have had to say thank you for supporting me and my family, my wife Cheryl, my daughters Alexa, Sydney, Andy, my son-in-law Logan, uh, during the difficult times that we have had the last three and a half, four years. Um, there's been a lot of pain in our lives, and I want to thank you for supporting us and encouraging us in so, so, so many ways. I especially want tonight to thank my wife, and I'm going to try to do it without crying. My wife is an amazing woman. She is resilient. She's strong. She has, she's looking around like, are you talking about me? <laughs> She has gone through a lot of crying and a lot of uncertainty, and that uncertainty is not over. Um, she's become the primary wage earner in our house. It has been for actually a while now. Um, I dedicated the very first book I did to Cheryl, and I don't think I've dedicated one since until this particular book. And um, I just want to say thank you publicly, babe, for your being the lifelong partner that's been so helpful in my life. Thank you. I love you. What I'd like to do now is show you a maybe three minute little book trailer video. It's a, a video that doesn't have any spoken words, but there's some text. It gives you the five big ideas, the five radical ideas in this particular text, God Can't. 
And then after it's done, I'd like to read a little of the postscript, and uh, then we'll just uh, hang out some more, and if you want, I'll sign some books. But uh, this little trailer is something I made myself, and it gives an idea of what the themes are of the book. I could have shown the other trailer that has me talking in it, but you have me here, so I don't need to talk. I'll, I'll show you this thing, so let's give it a shot. obviously make some big claims there, claims that you'll have to read the book to get the details on. But uh, I did want to give you a little bit more detail by reading a section of the postscript this evening. The book begins with a chapter that sort of sets the stage and asks the question of what evil really is, what love is like, and then each of the five chapters addresses the five themes that you just saw there. And I thought it would be wise at the end of the book to give a kind of a summary. So I wrote a postscript. This is what the postscript says. A year before my 20th birthday, six important people in my life died. My friend Jay perished when his car slid off a cliff headed to college after Christmas break. My best friend's mom, Vivian, died of a heart attack. My uncle Leonard was killed at an intersection when an alcohol-impaired driver ran a stop sign. My grandpa Tom died when tumors spread throughout his stomach. My former girlfriend, Tammy, died when the car she was in rolled on an interstate freeway. And my fellow college class council member, Stephanie, died of a disease she'd been battling much of her life. Before these events, I'd thought about God's role in good and evil, but these events focused my thinking. 
at funerals and in conversations, I heard people trying to make sense of what had happened. A few gave up believing in God. Most continued to believe, but lost any genuine enthusiasm for faith. They consciously or unconsciously decided they had no real clue who God is and what God does. They gave lip service to religion and participated half-heartedly in faith communities. In my early 20s, I gave up faith for a period. My turn to atheism was motivated primarily by intellectual issues like the problem of evil. The reasons I had for believing no longer made sense. For the sake of intellectual honesty, I stopped believing in God. My return to faith came primarily through wrestling with my questions. I realized that if a loving God did not exist, I could not make sense of my deep intuitions about love. Without God as the ultimate love standard, I could not explain what love means and why I, or anyone else, ought to express it. These and related issues eventually led me to think it more plausible than not that God exists. But I did not and do not know this with certainty. It's good news that God can't. In light of my questions, and as an effort to help hurting people, I wrote this book. I want to comfort and encourage those who suffer. The five big ideas in this book can help us believe in God and love after tragedy, abuse, and other evils. I tried to show survivors victims and others that the God they reject or in whom they've lost confidence was not God at all. The true God of love does not cause or even allow evil. The spirit of love present to us in all creation is not morally irresponsible. The good news for those who hurt is that God couldn't have single-handedly prevented their pain. God is not to blame. Now, calling this good news will sound counterintuitive to some. But for thoughtful people who hurt, this news is reassuring. They no longer need to believe God abandons them, ignores them, or is punishing them. It's good news that God never wants or permits evil. These beliefs support what I call the uncontrolling love of God perspective. As I see it, this view portrays God more adequately than others do. It's different from what most people have been taught, and it's different from the God that my atheist friends reject. It fits well with the broad themes of the Bible and the, world seem, and the way the world seems to work. Jesus portrays this picture of God in his life, teachings, death, and resurrection. To my mind, and to the minds of many, the uncontrolling love of God perspective simply makes sense. Throughout this book, I included true stories from those who find the uncontrolling love view valuable. Because this view helps survivors of abuse, victims of tragedy, and other sufferers, I wanted to share their stories. They encourage on an intellectual and emotional level those who want to reconstruct their lives. Many survivors have discovered the God of uncontrolling love is not blameworthy. The good news that God can. I know, of course, some people will oppose the view I presented. Some will find it alarming or unsettling. Despite the comfort it gives those who hurt, Critics will reject it. Some will see the book's title, God Can't, and assume the God described must be weak or inactive. They'll think we must choose between a God who controls and a God who can't do anything. Having read this book, you know this choice is false. There's a third option. Our loving God is almighty without being able to control. Like a good parent, with the appropriate amount of influence, 
An uncontrolling God is neither feeble nor oppressive, neither anemic nor manipulative. God's love is supremely active and powerful. Therefore, God heals, protects, redeems, saves, empowers, inspires, calls, creates, guides, sanctifies, persuades, transforms, and more in loving relationship with creation. God does these activities without controlling others as creatures or creation cooperates. Survivors of evil and activists seeking positive change have this powerfully loving God as their source for healing and transformation. It's important to believe that God can't stop evil single-handedly. But it's also important to believe that God can act in powerful ways. These ways transform our lives and the world. They create and sustain existence. As we and others cooperate in loving relationship with the lover of us all, we enjoy the well-being that love provides. Our hope for good has its source in God's love. God can because God loves. Final section. The best way to understand that God can't do some things and can do others is to see God's power in light of God's love. The power of God's uncontrolling love is a relentless but non-coercive force empowering us and all creation. The God of uncontrolling love is also worthy of our worship. This God is awesome because awe-inspiring. I'm deeply motivated to worship this incomparable lover. I can wholeheartedly adore my uncontrolling creator, knowing that God neither causes nor allows the evil I've experienced or that I know about. I don't worry that God might punish, damn, or ignore me. God empowers us all to live life well. This God is worth worshiping. Let me conclude with a passage from the Apostle Paul. I hope it inspires you as it does me. Go after a life of love as if your life depended on it, because it does. And in my own words, the lover of the universe empowers and inspires us to live lives of love. Let's cooperate. Let's cooperate with the uncontrolling God of love. Thanks. Jay's been so kind to be the host for this evening, and uh, Amy's been kind to do all the work to get this stuff ready. Um, I asked Jay today if he would do something to can kind of conclude things before we have a chance to mill around and talk. and. You can ask questions in person, whatever you want to do. I would like for Jay to pray for me. Um, the way my book launches typically go is this, and this makes a lot of sense if you think about it. I do a ton of work to get the book ready. I send out reviews to people who I think can help me think things clearly, but most of the time it's people who are probably going to kind of agree with where I'm at. Then those people read the book, I get all kinds of positive feedback, and then the critics read it. <laughs> and then I get all kinds of negative. And that's totally natural. That's the way we are. I'm ready for that. But sometimes, you know, the critics wear on you. And sometimes people like things so well, you know, you're tempted to get a big head. <laughs> I want to have an even keel. I want to be a person who lives a life of love and humility to be able to withstand the attacks some of them are going to be legitimate, and I'll have to respond. Others won't be, and I'll have to figure out how to be kind and forgive. But also uh, handle the positive things that come, because I want to be a humble person. So I've asked Jay if you wouldn't mind to come and uh, pray for me and uh, conclude the evening. Before we pray, I want to say one thing. 17 degrees yesterday morning at 745. My daughter Haley uh, was... Uh, went out to her car to scrape the windows. 
of her 1996 Chevy Lumina. And uh, she was working away and uh, came in frantic a few minutes before eight. And she said, Dad, I can't get the windows clean. And uh, I, I was getting ready myself. I said, I'll be out in a couple minutes. So I, I made myself presentable and I went outside and I figured that probably had something to do with arm strength and a little experience. And the, I was hoping the car had warmed up a little more by the point the time I got out there. So I started scraping on my daughter's windshield and discovered that, my goodness, this was like nuclear power frost on her windows. And I kept scraping away and scraping away. And I knew I was down to glass, and yet the window was still not clear. All my years of driving cars, I never seen anything quite like this. And so I opened up the driver's door and I looked inside and sure enough, the window was frosted on the outside and the inside. And, and Tom, I tell that story because in a lot of ways, I think the mission of what you're trying to do in an awful lot of people's lives is to help them when people have tried to scrape the front of the window, we've always done it, and yet they still can't see clearly. Um, they can't make their way, and they're tempted to just throw in the towel, as you know very well. And uh, I do believe, and you help me see it, that God has an uncanny ability to squeeze good out of even uh, very, very difficult times. And so, um, thanks for the honor of giving me tonight to, uh, to be here with you and to be with all these folks and these folks out here. Um, and. Uh, we want to pray for you and for people who will be touched by your words to hopefully get the window clean on both sides. Mm, thanks. That's great. Can we pray together? <clears throat> Loving God, uh, this life is uh, complex and it requires risk and vulnerability and Sometimes we face challenges that cut to the core, and yet we still reach to you. And so tonight, Lord, I pray for my friend and my brother, Tom, and I pray for the work he has done and the work he is doing. And I pray especially, Lord, for those who will read his words and mold them with their own experiences their own hearts, in their own minds. And Father, by your grace that reaches beyond our ability to ask or imagine, I pray that by your spirit, you would work in all of that to squeeze every ounce of good possible from it. Thank you for Cheryl and for their family. Thank you, Lord, for friends and colleagues who have stood alongside Tom and encouraged him. Thank you, Lord, for the ways in which he's striving to be faithful to you and to the message you've laid on his heart. Mm -hmm. And so tonight, Lord, we celebrate the investment of time and thought and energy and blood and sweat and tears, not only for Tom, but for those who desperately need to know, Lord, the depths of your unsearchable love. Mm -hmm. And so by your spirit, go ahead of us, guide us, inspire us, and draw us, Lord, into ways that love you and others even more. For we pray for the sake of your kingdom, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Oh, sure. Um, there are some copies of the book here tonight. I had planned to have more, but they didn't make it to the mail. Uh, if you'd like to buy a copy, they're 15 bucks, and my daughters have changed. Uh, so if you bought a copy already and you brought it um, and you'd like me to sign it, I'm always honored to do that. It makes me feel really super great. Um, also, if you have some questions, I'd love to, to try to answer them, or you can send me an email. Most of all, thanks so much for coming tonight. It really makes me feel good. I really, really appreciate it. And I really was afraid that only five people would come. <laughs> so it's good to have all of you here. Thanks so much. Okay.
thanks to you for uh, following my Facebook.